the Zoom meeting, and uh, that's that's at the request of uh, Dr. Linda Garcia Merchant. Um, so we'll begin with a presentation titled "Intergenerational Witnesses Praxis," praxis which will be followed up by a brief Q and A session, which which I'll moderate. So it is with a tremendous pleasure uh, that I introduce uh, Dr. Merchant, the US Latino Digital Humanities Postdoctoral Fellow for the University of Houston's Recovering the US Hispanic Literary Heritage Program, a Latino Digital Humanities Program that is one of the first of its kind in the nation. I, I met Dr. Merchant at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln where we, we were both working on our graduate degrees, kind of two ships passing each other. Uh, Dr. Merchant was visiting, uh, considering, uh, should I move to Nebraska, right? And it was my job to take her around and show off the lovely campus center and all the other parts of campus. And what I remember is not the tour, but just sitting together, I, I think I was drinking coffee, and learning, learning about her work, work that was new to me then, and which she described with such passion. And it was truly memorable and inspiring. And, uh, and you continue to be inspiring. Um, Dr. Merchant holds a PhD in Chicana Latina Literary and Cultural Studies and Digital Humanities from the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. An award-winning documentary filmmaker, Garcia Merchant has directed and produced 11 films, including Las Mujeres de la Caucas, Cau Caucas Chicana, uh, Palabras Dulces, Palabras Amargas, and most recently, the autobiographical short No Es Facil. Uh, Garcia Merchant is also the co-founder of the Chicana por Mijerasa Digital Memory Collection, CPMR, an online repository of Chicana Latina second wave feminist materials and interviews. <clears throat> Her interview with the editors of Chicana Movidas, New Narratives of Activism and Feminism in the Movement Era, Making Chicana Movidas, is featured in the Atzlan, a journal of Chicano studies, spring 2020, special issue on Chicana feminism. Garcia Merchant's research site, Chicana Diasporic, a nomadic journey of the activists exiled, highlights the political ideological journey of the women of the Chicana Caucus, of the National Women's Political Caucus from 1973 to 1979, alongside the autobiographical experience of living as Mexican and Black during that same period. Acutely aware of the complexities that continue to present themselves through this identi identity, Garcia Merchant identifies as bicultural and Chicana. Presently, Garcia Merchant is working on a chapter exploring the life of her second wave feminist mother, Ruth Ria Mojica Hammer, for the manuscript in progress, Chicana Latina Trailblazers. So with that said, uh, I invite you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Balma. Here's the party left out. So. <laughs> So we walked to the union to go get coffee and, and it was just like a, you know, it was like a really quick trip. I came in on the bus and it was November and yeah, I think it was November and, uh, and they got everybody together for me to meet them, which was already a kind of a tip off for me. This was that Nebraska was a unique place. And before I could even ask him again, everybody was so pleasant and accessible. I mean, I got to meet the chair and all these folks and it was, it was, it was, it was amazing to just have this much access to all of the people that I would eventually be working with in the way of faculty, right? And so, and I remember walking into, um, into the union to go get the co our coffee and saying to Raul, because Raul at the time, we'd gone to, I think, DePaul or Columbia, so we'd both gone to the same graduate school for a little while, so we had similar experiences in Chicago. And I said, okay, I gotta ask you a question. And he started to laugh and he goes, no, it's always like this. <laughs> I was like, I was like, and, I, and I have to say that that really was a factor in my choosing to say yes, because, you know, grad school and grad school so quickly. I mean, I, I had literally eight weeks to get in my application. That's how fast that all happened. Um, and a research trip and a couple of presentations in the meantime. And so, um, I, you know, I was, uh, and I really think that reflects the nature of the graduate student experience at Nebraska. It's still like that. It's very collaborative. It's very, it's very affirming. It's very generous, you know, um, and we're encouraged to do that. And I think that is one of the many reasons I finished and finished on time. And uh, because it was, there was, I felt that sense of community about 
uh, UNL. Um, and Raul, you know, was a perfect example of that on day one. And so, so thank you very much, Dr. Palma. Thank you very much uh, to the Latin American Studies Program for this opportunity to speak. I'm going to mention two people who are actually on this call. Yes, I'm going to shout you both out, uh, who our authors are, are contributing. Well, one is a contributing editor to Chicano Movidas, Dr. Uh, Espinosa, who I see is on the call. I didn't think she was coming. Um, so I'm really happy to see that she's here. Uh, along with Meili Blackwell and Maria Cotera, who were the editors of that of this wonderful anthology that also reflects this very intergenerational experience um, that we that we live in the work that we do. Uh, and the other is an author, uh, a contributing author, uh, Amory Perez, Dr. Amory Perez, who is waving, um, who writes uh, extensively. And I invite you to to look at her work, uh, both of their work. Um, Dion works a lot. They both are writing very much about second uh, Chicana feminists and feminisms. Uh, one very focused on the women of the Partido, that would be Dr. Espinosa, um, and the women of Northern New Mexico. Um, one of the reasons we're doing the work that we are doing in Northern New Mexico. And Dr. Perez um, uh, is, is done extensive writing on um, Betita Martinez, formerly at some point known as Elizabeth Sutherland, um, who is a, you know, sort of a, is an iconic uh, feminist Chicana uh, activist um, in, a, in a number of movements. Uh, and um, and Anne Marie has written about her in a, in a variety of ways, um, but is doing some real, and I think a book, right? You're doing a book. It's it's the dream. If I can <laughs> get to Stanford, it's the dream. <laughs> so yes, I you know I'm um, I'm uh, really glad that you're both here because I am going to be talking about Chicana por Mirasa and the the you know what it what it creates in this way of community, and that I mentioned um, the. Uh, but anyway, so I invite you to, to really you know, look at these two scholars who are doing this wonderful work and have been doing it for a very long time, um, even before we started Chicana por Mirasa. So, um, um, and I say that to say that once you become a part of this community, you know, you don't leave because <laughs> it is really about building this community and these relationships that are ongoing and lifelong and, and um, are not just organic, but um, essential to the work specifically around um, a, a, a particular woman and, and the representations, the, the, the influences that that woman has had in a movement or in, in you know, local and national work. Uh, but they're, they're, they're human relationships because uh, some of them are single mothers, some of them are, are mothers of, are, you know, in, in, in traditional married, uh, relationships where they're, or traditionally partnered relationships, I probably should say, um, where the, um, the, the, the spouse, the partner is very supportive of the work, right? And Martha Cotera says, you can't have social justice in the world if you don't have it in your home. And so, and, and I, you know, and I say that to say that it always comes back to that, that intentional human relationship that is so necessary to this work and this understanding of, uh, of intergenerational witness. And so it isn't just uh, witnessing the work, it is also witnessing the relationships and then articulating those relationships and our own individual interpretations of the work. So I'm gonna share my screen. I've got, um, I've got pictures. <laughs> I can remember which one of these does that. Okay. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about so the topic is intergenerational witness as praxis. Can everyone see the screen? Just if you can't, just holler. Um, you good? Okay. Uh, all right. So my notes. So, uh, so when so in building Latino digital collections, it also means building a collective of practitioners and students and scholars and and community members in this democratized relationship to the cultural production of a collection or a project or however you're thinking about this. Um, so I'm going to look at the work of these two organizations, Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Program and the Chicano Por Mirasa Digital Memory Collect Collective. And yes, I have a relationship to both, um, but it is also 
um, in the in the seven months I've been a postdoc, I and even before that, I recognized parallels in our work and the 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 focus on this understanding of the importance of witness in in uh, in both areas. And so I thought, well, this is a good way to think about it because it is our practice. And now I can't get okay. There it is. I lost my mouse. But first, we witness. Donde estamos en las historias de estos lugares donde hemos existido y seguimos existiendo? So where are we in the stories of these places where we have existed and continued to exist? And how do we manifest that? We manifest it through the recovery of materials and the discovery that we have with those materials. And then we articulate that so that the process is both the journey and the result. Um, I always say to my students and to anyone that I work with, digital humanities has got to be fun or else don't do it. Um, and so uh, I wanna talk a little bit about um, praxis, which is based on the practice of self-care, um, attention to trauma and with a dynamic relationship to the archive as a quote, space of encuentro, end quote. Uh, which is uh, from Maria Cotera's article, uh, Nuestra Autohistoria, which I believe is an American quarterly. I'm actually gonna end with that too. Uh, where students, faculty and practitioners of culture and technology center community-based knowledges and experiences. The collaborative ethic applies with an understanding that each member has a productive insight into the vision of the project because all voices matter on topics or subjects that live in precarity have been neglected or remain silent. So there's a lot of the idea, you know, this, this is based on, uh, it, it, it's based on the precarity of the material. It's based on the precarity of our projects. It's based on the precarity of our relationships to the academy. Um, you know, the work that we do in digital humanities isn't often recognized in tenure packages or, or, you know, it is a little more, depending on your discipline, it is a little more in, in the job market, but you better have that job, you better have that book contract, you know, to be, to be competitive in the market. And so this kind of work, which is just as important, if you're doing research on someone who hasn't existed or exists, or you know exists, but doesn't actually exist in the archive in a way that is overt, right? Um, like they don't have their own collection, but they exist in other collections, right? You see the names, you see the people and you wonder well, who is this person and what, why, are they, why are they in this collection? What is this relationship to this thing? Um, and so the detective work to complete, to do the research that we have to do takes much longer than in many traditional instances of the detective work. Uh, so I'm gonna do, uh, this is sort of what I'm gonna talk about today, this brief history of both the programs, recovery and CPMR. So if you're not familiar, you know, to bring you up to speed on that. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about traditional and non-traditional models of collecting, why that's important, uh, the importance of access, centering community-based knowledges, storytelling as a knowledge exchange, which transforms the digital cultural record ultimately, and then precarity. I'm gonna show you examples. Um, again, I'm gonna start with the recovery program. So reco when, I when, I met, when I talk about it as a recovery program, uh, the, the um, recovery in the US Hispanic literary heritage began in the 90s, I wanna say it was the early 90s. So it's about 30 years old. Um, and it is the offshoot of Arte Publico Press, which starts much earlier than that with this group of scholars who all have tenure. That's very important to the story. <laughs> these, these scholars have tenure and because they have tenure, they can study what they're interested in. Like they, they, have, they actually have the opportunity to study Latino literature in, in substantively. And so um, Dr. Canelos, who is, a, is, is a still our director, begins a press to uh, ultimately publish some of the material, some of the manuscripts that were found. And, and um, so about, about 10, 12 years later, um, because they were doing all of this collecting and archiving, um, Dr. Canelos recruits um, Dr. Baisa Ventura and Dr. Villarreal to begin the uh, actual, an actual structured project on recovering liter literature. Uh, which becomes the Recovering the U.S. Hispanic Literary Heritage Project. And so um, 
a few years ago, so the, the, the latest iteration of Recovering the U.S. Hispanic uh, Literary Heritage Project, uh, which includes a couple of things, a number of things. Uh, so the, 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 the description is, the inter it's an international program to locate, preserve, and disseminate Hispanic culture in the United States um, in its written form since colonial times until 1980. And so we have stuff that goes really far back. Um, and so a few years ago, uh, it was just, it was determined that because we've done all of this collection for almost 30 years, that it was a good time and had established all these protocols and had this whole infrastructure in place, that it was a good time to extend this into uh, a mentoring, teaching, uh, more structured format that would have a focus on digital humanities, but Latino digital humanities, not just digital humanities. And so USLDH was born from a Mellon grant um, with the goal of establishing a hub for mentoring, training, scholarship, and with the goal of developing a discipline. And it is the first of its kind in the US. And uh, I'm very excited to be a part of it because it's amazing to be in a place where we're building a discipline. That's like so cool. So, um, so, uh, so we have uh, a, a, a hundreds of thousands of microfilmed and digitized items. Again, we've been collecting for uh, over 30 years, a vast collection of photographs, an extensive authority list and personal papers. And we published the first comprehensive anthologies of Latino literature. I highly recommend looking through the Arte Publico Press um, catalog and finding uh, the books are just incredible. Um, and you can you know, purchase those books. Some of the books are available online as PDFs. I'm not sure about which are, but take a look at the catalog. There's some very interesting books there. So we have more than 20,000 records that include poetry, pamphlets, historical documents, cookbooks, religious newspapers. Here we see somebody uh, scanning some materials from uh, the Cosmopolitan Opera School. I've never actually looked at that document, wow. Uh, it's an incredible place to work, actually. We have 1,400 newspapers. Um, let's see, I've got a note about the newspapers. Uh, where's my note about the newspapers? Oh, uh, in English, Spanish, French, and Ladino, as you can see demonstrated here. Uh, and they and the papers go back to the middle of the 19th century. So it's, it's a pretty substantial collection of newspapers. Um, let's see. Okay, so um, I think that was all I was gonna say about that. Oh, so the other place, do you wanna look for our stuff? Oh, I forgot that slide, uh, is in Newsbank. So we are, if you have a subscription to Newsbank, you will find us under the American Historical Newspapers in the Hispanic newspaper uh, collection. That's us, that's actually us. And that's a revenue generating um, entity for us because you know we've got to keep the doors open and the lights on. So, uh, and it is one way to, provide this extensive collection of newspapers uh, to the larger public uh, and for research within institutions. Uh, so Ch Chicana por mi raza started in 2009. I've got a little uh, timeline here. Uh, Maria Cote, Dr. Maria Cotera and myself uh, as a filmmaker at the time uh, began this collection project because there, it, there was no resource and we recognized the absence of our own parents. So one of the reasons we are, uh, we know each other is because our parents worked, our mothers worked in the movement together. They were second wave feminists. They were both part of the Chicano caucus and the Rasoni, the party and a number of other things that they, that they worked on uh, together over a 10 year period. In fact, my own research is actually on the Chicana caucus of the National Women's Political Caucus, uh, because it is a history we don't know as Chicanas and as feminists. So you know, for, for a while there, feminism was a not a not a not a happy word for Latinas because we didn't know that we had a relationship to feminism unless we took a class in college. And so uh, so we started the project with the goal of creating a repository that would, could be available to scholars and community members and the subjects themselves. Uh, so that was in 2009. Up to date, we've collected 150 oral filmed histories, or interviews, and uh, over 10,000 documents from the women. It is a post-custodial archive in that we don't keep the actual documents. We, doc we digitize them, we scan them, and give the uh, subjects that uh, whose 
uh, histories that we're highlighting, a copy of those of those scans you know, for their own use. Uh, one of the reasons we don't take their materials is uh, we don't have a place to put them. Uh, we're not a library, and so uh, and because we were located in the Midwest for a very long time. You know, if you're working on someone in California, do you really want their archive in Michigan or Indiana? I mean, you don't, you want it wherever they are. Uh, and so, but we have uh, advocated for collections to be at uh, institutions that are geographically uh, uh, clo closer to where the person either did their work or lives. Uh, and in 2012, we started uh, one of several partner projects that we've had. Uh, the Somos Latina Partner Project at the University of Wisconsin with Professor uh, Andrea Arenas, who has gone on to have a relationship with the Wisconsin Historical Society. It's, an, it's a collection you can find online. Uh, those also are filmed. It was entirely done with students, uh, as is much of the work that we do. Uh, it, so our projects are always student-centric. Uh, in, in 2013, we got a scalable research grant to develop that repository. So for, for the first four years, we were just collecting on hard drives and we had lots of hard drives. Um, in 2017, we migrated from the uh, scalable research grant that we had that was through the University of Illinois Urbana to the University of Michigan's uh, DH space. That took a year, so our repository was offline. Um, it is a secured login based system um, in that period of time, from 2013 to 2017, the public site, our first version of our public site launched. Um, and again, all of these links are at the end of the, the presentation. Uh, in 2018, our public site experienced a Bitcoin hack. And fortunately, we have a, 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 an employed digital archivist who had to piece that site back together. It was a Drupal site, had to piece it back together. Um, and but so we were down for three months. Fortunately, it was the three months in the summer. And so anyone that was using this in the classroom, it, you know, we didn't have quite as much traffic. So it was it was it, it you know, you never want your site down. But if you're going to have your site down, have it down in the summer. Um, because, you know, there aren't as many people accessing it for the classroom. A lot of people use it for the classroom. Um, and in 20. So we relaunched in 2018. And then in 2020, Maria Cotera got an offer to come to the University of Texas. Yay, we're very happy about that. Um, um, so if you have a chance to read Maria Cotera's article about her essay in American Quarterly on our relationship with Michigan, um, it may give you some indication of why Texas, we're very happy that Maria ended up in Texas. <laughs> Uh, Texas has welcomed us with open arms and has, gives every indication uh, that they will be an, in the kind of institutional partner that we want for the project. Um, and that is to allow us to create this repository and these structures, these organizational structures for the material that really do reflect the goal of foregrounding language and culture and witness and intergenerational witness to the materials and to their teaching and to our method. Um, and so in 2021, uh, we are launching our first digital, our, it's a public history project by collecting the materials for uh, Enrique Tavasquez, who has this relationship with Northern New Mexico that is also about the Chicano movement and Colorado and the women's movement. I mean, it's got a lot of threads, right? But that is also in an area of Northern New Mexico with an, with a, with a, with a, an acute awareness of collecting and the importance of collecting and recording a history in, in analog form, but we're helping them move this into a digital, a, a digital world and what that means, right? So uh, one of the reasons we do to kind of up is the um, absence of presence, right? Uh, or that Maria likes to call the absence of presence, right? So we start the project because we know that this archival absence in no way reflected the reality. Here are, here are pictures of our mothers during their time of activism. My mother was on the most popular show during its time slot on Thursday nights. 
So my mother was a household name in Chicago, originally from Chicago, and is one of the reasons she runs for Congress. First Latina in the state of Illinois to run for Congress, comes to the attention of the National Women's Political Caucus and becomes the first vice chair of the caucus, right? So this is a, during the women's movement. If you know anything about the National Women's Political Caucus? It's one of the political arms. It, it's kind of like the political, it's, it's like the women's pack, right? It's the political action arm of the, of the movement. Uh, encouraging women to run for office, helping to teach us how, uh, helping to teach people to be politicized, all these things, right? Uh, Marta Cotera um, is uh, sitting in her office at this point as the head of the Chicana Research and Learning Center. Uh, center started with a federal grant, if my research may correct, um, and is uh, very much a part of the Partido Rasta Unida, very much part of the women's movement, uh, the Texas Women's Political Caucus, very, very influential and, one, and considered one of the mothers of Chicana feminism, right? She writes a, a seminal text, Chicana, the Chicana Feminist, and the Osayembra, uh, which have been very cited and very recognized um, in a lot of Chicana, lit in, in Chicana feminist literature and writing. Um, and so we knew that our mothers were influencers, right? The word that we now use uh, during this period, but nowhere was there any record of this. Um, I'm often told by scholars uh, who are working in the archives and working on some aspect of either Midwest history or women's history or something, who literally have said to me a number of times, you know, I kept coming across your mom's name, but I didn't understand her relationship to any of this. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> you know. So we recognize the erasure that occurred, not just for our mothers who did have leadership roles in these, in these movements, but for the thousands of other women who did have roles locally and, um, and regionally and nationally to these movements uh, that were not present in the literature that's been produced and so, or to any extent that's been produced. And so the other issue we were always dealing with is well, where are the Chicana archives, right? And here's two examples of the, where the Chicana archives are. This is, uh, this is actually a shed behind Enriqueta Vasquez's house uh, that is a windowless shed, but it's Northern New Mexico. So, you know, the weather's not entirely inclement. Um, and so there's all these materials inside of the shed that is part of the work that she was doing. Um, in Northern New Mexico as part of the activist work that she was doing in the, in the various movements. The other is the Los Angeles, California garage of, uh, oh, I'm totally blanking on her name, but she's a, a, a feminist socialist who we interviewed in 2010, um, Yolanda Lanis, sorry. Um, and uh, here we are about to open it. Now she is an archivist. And so these materials are very well organized and protected. You see, we're all wearing uh, aprons um, and staying, you know, our distance. And she's, you know, and she's showing us materials that we are eventually going to uh, document. Uh, but this is where the Chicana archives live. And so uh, one of the witnesses that our students have always been able to experience in, the, in, these, in this project is uh, not just the materials, but where they are and our conversations with women that we often have to convince to be a part of this because the response when we ask them is, well, who would, who would want to see this stuff? And you know, it's it's and you have to explain it. It's like no, no, no. It, what you did was important, whether it's ever been validated or not. And often, our interaction with these women is the first time that that's happened. That they've have that it's ever been valid. That it's ever been seen in this way, uh, because a lot of these women do this work away from their families. And you know, as, as because in the '70s, we were just beginning to understand divisions of labor in the house and, and that working outside of the home was okay. You know, we were just beginning to do those things and understand that it was all right. And so a lot of these women do this work, you know, on at night, on the weekends and away from the family without any sort of presence within the family. And so, and it's always wonderful to watch their children or their, or their relatives Look, looking at them in this sort of stunned silence that, who are you? I didn't know this, you know, this whole other part of your life that I don't know anything about. And here, here's this whole group of people willing to document you in this way. 
So there is that kind of witness that happens in those moments for these women and for our students uh, that is profound because we've 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 um, we've um, we've helped students. We we foregrounded them with an understanding of these women before we go on these research trips. But their, their introduction to these women is always about the humanity of them, which is wonderful, right? So our students don't just have the witness of these incredible stories. They also have, they begin to develop individual relationships with them because they share uh, certain aspects of their own lives that are similar to their lives now and in the past. And so, uh, we have a number of students that have worked on this project that um, can maintain relationships with these women after 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 they're done, you know, in the term or in the in the research uh, um, the research pro, you know, the, the time that we're in the at a site visit, um, and so it's and out of that comes these these interpersonal relationships that are also about this witness, you know, that is that is creating this value and this understanding of its importance. So I want to touch lightly about um, traditional non traditional models. Actually, I'm, I'm going to go really quickly through this because I want to get to the this, this last little bit. Um, so one of the things is, as we think about traditional uh, DH, and specifically public facing projects, there is this there is this understanding that accessibility is going to occur through the structure of the institution. It has a certain amount, you know, and, and that access will occur, especially, especially in, in digital projects, that access will occur if there, is, um, if there is funding to make it happen, to create the collection, to digitize the collection, to put it online in a way that um, tells a story about that collection. Uh, which is great if there is community involvement, but if there isn't community involvement to any extent where the community has advocacy or agency with the contents being processed, then what is the story that that collection is telling? And so in that way, those collections become finite because often you have what I like to call artifacts in a vacuum, uh, materials that are in a collection and are described for their materiality and little else. Uh, so uh, again, an, a, an example of this is, you know, my mother showing up on documents and, and you're wondering, well, who is the, who are these other women who are part of this group that are putting on this conference, but there's no other information about them, right? And one of the issues with that is that often traditional DH projects are based on material that's already been written, right? So that there are books and there are, there are projects that have already been produced that, that have foregrounding information for a student to then look at the materials in a way that where they've already got a history and a, and a knowledge that may not be present in the description of a, 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 an object, a subject, um, the event that's being presented. Uh, and I've already talked a little bit about community, uh, community engagement. The other issue is the top-down knowledge delivery. Um, and this is, this is part of this, the big difference between the work that we do. Um, scholars have an understanding of material, and which is fine because there's an understanding that will apply to a certain audience. Community has a different understanding of that material. It is, and it's, it's no less important. And one of the things that is that is very different about, at least I believe, that is very different about Latino DH is that, uh, and I say, I've said this a couple of times that we foreground language and culture. And when it, what it means to foreground language and culture means that we are considering who is speaking in what context they are speaking and, and the who and the what is being spoken about, right? And so, um, um, an artifact, um, uh, uh, a memorandum, for example, that is written by a subject. If the subject is still alive, we are going to be in conversation with that subject about what was the purpose in writing this? When was it written? Who wrote it? Who contributed to it? Was there more than one author? You know, but the understanding that there is probably a story to every artifact that exists within the collection because every one of those artifacts tells a different part of the story or tells a segment of a larger story. 
And so students then began to see the relationships and the connections between the materials and the archives. Um, and then of course, institutional support is who's documenting, who's, who's collecting, how those collections are presented, if they're presented, and who has access to those collections once they are in the, in the, in the library, in the academy. And this is not bashing the library in any way because libraries only have so much amount of money and time. Um, and if the only descriptions that a library can provide are material, what does that say to a young scholar who is trying to learn about a history or learn about someone who isn't necessarily in the archive? Does that document give them the entire story? What is the story that individual document is telling and how is it connected to the rest of that collection? And institutions don't often have the time to do that. And advocacy with the you know, community, community agency isn't always present. So one of the things that is different, again, um, is you know, one, of the, one of the things we always start with is this understanding of self-care in Latinx digital humanities. Again, relationships and network, centering community-based knowledge and experience. Uh, we begin with the community. Understanding the value of contribution occurs with both the subjects, the objects, and the experience of both, not just with each other, but on their own. You know, that, that correspondence written on the back of hotel stationery is written on the back of hotel stationery for a reason, you know, because that's a moment of strategy. And there's a story that I just got goosebumps when I said that. There's a, there's a story there and it's a profound story and the subject is still alive to tell it. How much richer does that object become? Uh, and in that way, it is about a transgenerational knowledge exchange that is about access. One of the things with our, our repositories, not just at USLDH and at Recovery, but at, at, in CPMR, is that there is always access by the subject. Our subjects are able to access their materials through the secured uh, login system at any time that they want. They have a login, they can look at their stuff, they can, they can annotate it for us if they'd like, if we've, if we've asked them to do that, or if they need their materials because they, we don't know what they've done with the jump drive, they can actually access whatever they need for a talk they might be giving. So they always have access to that material. So I'm going to end here with a, a little conversation about precarity. One of the reasons intergenerational witnesses practice is so important to us is because we have always operated with precarity as a purpose, right? I mean, funding has always been challenging. Institutional relationships have always been challenging. Uh, the fact that we want to foreground language and culture in an understanding of witness to documents and subjects and their, their, con their connectivity really sort of defines us as a bit revolutionary. <laughs> and so I, I kind of want to end with this comment about, you know, I, I mentioned to Maria at some point, I said, you know, precarity is the reason we exist. I mean, that's our, that's our MO, right? Because we're always wondering, are we going to be around in 10 years? And so this is actually from uh, the American Quarterly uh, article. If the implicit definition of an archive is its permanence, then the Chicano Bermudasa Digital Memory Collective refuses the favor, opting instead for the unprofessional and unruly, the subversive and permanent yet generative space of the undercommons. In other words, yes, we have the master's tools, but we certainly aren't going to deconstruct the master's house. We're just gonna build a house next door. Uh, and so uh, there was one last thing I wanted to say. So this is an example of how we think about this whole community coming together and this connectivity. So here's Enrique Tavasquez in the background. There's Dr. Espinosa actually also in the background image. And I think behind the, the graphics are, is Maria Cotera and there's the camera because we're about to film a segment of her interview. But we were thinking about this entire, you know, as we think about Northern New Mexico, it is about these different understandings of what is important to Northern New Mexico. This project, this person, the other people that are part of this community and why it's important because it is about community building and teaching a community how to build these kinds of collections. And on that note, I will leave you with this. Thank you very much. Here's some links to 
the uh, different um, uh, our sites. So you've got Arthur Publico Press, the Recovery Project. I, I invite you to look at our best practices. This is really how we think about the work and the whole understanding of self-care. And then of course, the Chicano Formidasa Digital Member Collective. I'm opening the floor for questions. I did it in 45. Look at there, Marla. Look at there. <laughs> Thank you, Linda. No, that was excellent. Here, let me put the on the. It's not real unless I put the reaction. So there we go. <laughs> Full applause. Uh, so I I, do, I have a question maybe that I'll start out with, and then uh, I do want to open the floor. Uh, we got about fifteen minutes for questions, and it it has to do with precarity. Um, I put in the chat uh, the article that you referenced. Um, and in the article, uh, Maria Cotora describes the work of Latino digital humanities, right, as entering into a new space, one of precarity, of swimming against the tide, as you described, right, looking for funding, uh, but without fear of impermanence or change, right, and, uh, and this at once, it sounds frustrating, but urgent, and also very rewarding, it, uh, a kind of virtue in itself, a justice in itself, and I, I was wondering, you know, if you think I fairly uh, described that, if you could speak a little bit more towards this idea of like the importance of this impermanence, right? Hmm. <laughs> so I, you know, um, so we've been around what, 2009, so 11 years, is that right? 11, 12 years, 12 years. Um, wow, 12 years. Uh, and we started this, I mean, I had a full-time job at the time. I worked on it nights, weekends, took all my vacations to go on our research trips. I mean, it was that kind of, because we could never get funding, right? Uh, the institution really wanted us to work within the structures of the library. And we kept countering and saying, you know, the library, I love me some LOC and Dublin Core, but we have different ways of <laughs> describing things and it doesn't quite work. And so, uh, you know, we start with the object and then we, we end with the description, you know, we end, and the, and the description is anecdotal. It has a, it's time, it's place, it's here, it's that, you know, it was very different. And I mean, think 10 years ago, where digital humanities it was, uh, it was extremely different. You know, here are these two Latinas who get together and decide to do this project. Um, I come out of, I come out of technology. I mean, I was, I had helped to build a database in private industry at my old job and so so I was like well okay no we should do this this way and and so while people understood that we knew what we were talking about they weren't willing to give us the funds to do it so and I, re I remember I'm reminded of the the second time we were turned down we didn't get an ACLS grant I mean we've been turned down by everybody like everybody you know every every funding <laughs> agency uh, but we found a way, you know, Maria gets research funds, Maria would get job offers, Maria would threaten to leave, and then the university would come back, you know, and this, this is nothing that Maria hasn't, that hasn't spoken about publicly regularly, right? And so, but we never thought we wouldn't exist. And I think it is because we come from parents, mothers who worked in this space of precarity. I mean, my work with Chicana Diasporic is very much about is framed as these activists working in exile from the women's movement and the and the Chicano movement, because there's these you know two different these two very different um, because there's about agency there's about advocacy. My mother talks all the time. I mean, in in many of her interviews about the the white feminists suggesting that they my favorite story is the bilingual newspaper. Right, they wanted to give the Chicano caucus a bilingual newspaper. Or, or no, pay, a newspaper in Spanish. And my mother said, well, you really don't need to do that because most of us are bilingual. And so <laughs> we don't really need that. And one of the feminists asked after the meeting, uh, asked why she was resistant to that. And my mother said, you know, that's all fine and great, but when we really want something, I don't want you to say to me, but we gave you a newspaper. Isn't that enough? You know, <laughs> so there was, a, there was an understanding of, of strategy. Um, and an understanding that you that they were always having to fight against this understanding that wasn't going to allow them to to exist, right? And so 
we were we were kind of of the of the of the thought that well everybody's turning us down but we're still here we know this is important we know this is necessary so we're just going to keep doing it we had a lot of role models for this so so precarity became our purpose right because yeah i mean if 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 it came to a point we paid for the the hosting out of our own pockets you know i mean it was a lot of that and so because we believe in this work and we see where and how it does transform and so um and this this is not this is not us it's about the work i also remember this other time when we went to interview um sherry muraga and Maria and I, the, the, the students, we were all coming out of the, the, the interview and going to the car. And, she, and Sherry Muraga had made a comment about, about Bridge and that she and Gloria had recruited or at least reached out to the Black feminists because nobody knew who they were, right? And, and it just kind of hit me in that moment. I'm like, walking to the car, I said, Maria, this is kind of, we're, this is our bridge. And she looked at me, she goes, no, it's not, get in the car. I was, but I, you know, as, and as, as I, I laugh about it now, and I, it's, I was sort, I was sort of joking, but not because in 50 years, we won't be here. None of us will be here, but the work will remain. And the students who have been influenced and, and, and transformed by the work and begin to apply these methods in their own disciplines, you know, that's really the goal for us. That's, those are the seeds that we hope we're planting and we believe we're planting and we are beginning to see. I mean, we've had students who've gone on to graduate school uh, be, just because we are there present doing the work and they are seeing us doing the work, right? It isn't just being in the academy, it's being a cultural practitioner and being valued for the cultural practice that you are bringing to the work and the projects and so um so yeah i hope that answered your question that was i'm so i have my moments and i'm just like you know liberté right <laughs> <laughs> that's it was beautiful and seeing the photos right um of your mother and maria cotera working uh was was lovely the students I, love those pictures especially the big hair pictures we have pictures <laughs> of Aranieto gomez in a photo booth when she's about 16 and they're just delightful i'm there are yeah i love i love our archive Oh, uh, we have a question from Kate, Kate Delaney. Hi, Kate. Hi. Um, yeah, I have a quick question about the research aspect. Um, I'm interning at the um, Tompkins County His History Center um, downtown this semester, actually. So I was really interested in what you were saying about when like, you would find an article um, like referencing three people and you couldn't find any more information on the other two people. Like, I guess my question is like, where would, what was your process after that? Like, how do you start to find out who those people are um, and more information about them? That's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so depending on who gives you the collection, right? Where the collection comes from, uh, that's always the starting point. So when, when I talk about networks and relationships, one of the reasons we're very much in touch and in relationships with the women that we work with um, and in all of the projects, not just with CPMR, but with USLDH, is that there will be moments where there are people that we need identified, you know, and so to be in, again, it is about being in conversation with the documents and with the community that represents those documents, you know, that is someone that can actually, can actually answer questions or give you stories or maybe give you leads because they know the story of that document. So I would say that's one way to think about it, you know, and in a way it's kind of crowdsourcing that and to say, hey, I've got this doc. One of the things we do at, um, at, um, at Recovery is we have a bot that actually um, posts different uh, documents that we're not entirely familiar with to say, has anybody seen this or do you know this? Uh, a student actually developed, I believe that bot for us. Um, and, that people will say, oh yeah, that's from this event or such event. And I remember that so-and-so was, you know, again, there's a story with every every document and every photograph or people, students all the time will say, oh my gosh, that's my aunt so-and-so. I didn't know she was an act, you know, that kind, of, that kind of thing. But that really does lead you on the the additional information that you can get about that, that 
yeah. So I would reach out, you know, look at when something was produced, where it was produced, the kinds of organizations that were producing those kind of materials at that time. But, you know, that's a kind of that that's a good approach. And if you have a relationship with the people that produced the collection or you know donated the collection, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Okay. There was another question, I think. Right. Thank you, Lorena. Look, uh, one of my colleagues is on this. Call. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Gotro. <laughs> There was another, there was another uh, question. Linda, yeah, I, I wanted to first thank you for, for your amazing talk and the work that you do. Uh, I'm Enrique, one of the Spanish professors here at Itaca College, and there are several colleagues here from art history okay. uh, and actually from Cornell too, and, and the Center for the Study of Culture, Race and Ethnicity. So a lot of people here listening to your talk but I had a question, maybe brief question, because we have another one uh, and we only have five minutes. But the, the question that I have was when you were talking about thinking about democratizing or decolonizing the archive and how, how the, the work that you're doing deals with that. So I wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about more how to do it, you know, the hands on way of, of decolonizing the archive, because if we think about archives and libraries, as you were saying, most of them are interested in white uh, European dudes, right? So, so not because it's an archive and it's a library uh, university is going to be uh, archiving the, the work that you are doing. So, so that's, I wanted to ask you. Oh, sure. So one of the things, so the approach is about uh, that so and it's not it's not mine it is our foremother Martha Cotera writes about this in the in the early 80s I believe um, where she talks about the fact that all all knowledge is important even chisme is important you know even gossip is important because it's still telling a story you know that has its 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 nuggets of fact right and you, but it is still telling a story and it's still telling a story that foregrounds culture and language because that's also a story, right? And that's, so that's the thing that we, we are always conscious of um, in all the work we do. It is about foregrounding language and culture and what does that mean, right? Because we are talking about US Latino histories. We are talking about our contributions to histories. Because the, uh, because the, the other thing, and, and I didn't mention this, but um, we are also in a process of unlearning when we are doing this work. And it is the unlearning of educational indoctrination. We learn about the history of this United States from the voice of the victor. And we are not represented in that voice. And we have to understand how to not necessarily devalue that voice, but to reapply value to our own voices and our own history which is just as important because it is making the same level of contribution acknowledged or not, it is still making that level of contribution. And so it is that understanding that we apply to the work and to our collective contributions to the work. So the technologist writing the scripts for a Drupal site has in their articulation of that Drupal site, their own authorship of this work. And that's just as important as the scholar writing content, as the subject telling the story, as the student writing the blog post, because there is that contemporary perspective of that story that is about, I'm a first gen, this person's a first gen, this person was 22 or 24 and leading a, a, a campaign, you know, it was the campaign manager for a governor. I was the same age. What am I doing with my life? I mean, it's that those kinds of points of access that we hope that our students will then carry into their own, and they have said this to us that, you know, they keep coming back to do like capstone and independence and all this stuff. And I'm like, why do you keep coming back? And I've had students say more than once, because now this is my responsibility. It's that level of ownership that carries it forward, that makes it, that gives it the permanence that funding never does, that, you know, living in a space of precarity never will, right? But it's that level of permanence. So 
I would say that, it, yeah, it's a, it, it's that form of decolonizing in that we, we, we are doing a whole process of unlearning. Did that answer your question? I hope it answered your question. Okay. <laughs> and we have uh, one more question from Jennifer Jolly. Hi there. Thank you so much. That was wonderful to hear about and so exciting. I'm like, so curious to <laughs> dig through some of these online resources. It's wonderful. Yay. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, what this brings back to me is years ago, I was working cataloging slides. And I remember also in this vein of decolonizing how frustrating it was to figure out how to catalog something when it didn't fit the standard model. Right, um, the standard model used for um, European art, for example. Right. And and so this this was very much in my mind as I was listening to you talk, and you alluded to this in a number of ways. And I was wondering if you could actually just say a little bit more about how does the actual cataloging of these papers and pamphlets and objects have to rethink the very structures of cataloging, um, you know, to to again think outside that colonial mindset or think think in new ways about what matters and what counts. And I don't know if you could give us like an example of a object that you particularly enjoy or a pamphlet that you particularly enjoy that might help so, us. I would, okay, so that's a great question. I would say that again, it is about foregrounding the, um, the object in conversation. So the object becomes the conversation, right? Yeah. So it is It is the subject who uh, it may own, you know, if it's a correspondence, if it's, if it's a program, if that person either produced the program or was on the committee to produce that program, that whole story that, that, that belongs with that document is attached to that document. So we start with the document and, uh, and we, you know, we do describe the materiality of it, what size it is, what paper it's made, you know, where, where it's from, where it was produced, when it was produced. We do include all of that. But the additional element then becomes the, the story that accompanies or stories that accompany that document. If it's a part of a larger initiative that was launched at a certain point, because a lot of these women start things, right? They start organizations, they start movements, they start issue-based activism, they're always starting things. And so a lot of the documents apply to those events, those organizations, those collective organs. So, and that's why I say that it, it, we begin with the document and work our way out into the networks that that document is connected to and the way it's connected. And that's that's the approach we have to cataloging, which is why we use the system that we use, which foregrounds the image, not the information. And, but, that, but we do we do use the traditional structure. Of it, you know, it's, we use all of that. We do do that because we do want to be able to tap into we, we want to be able to create data sets. We want to be able to do all the kinds of things that you do with that kind of information. But we do, we begin with the document and the story of it. Does that, does that answer your question or is that? Okay, perfect. And it, and it makes me think about the importance of technologies then that allow those kind of networks and links to be visible. And right. do, do you also include oral, oral recordings as part oh, of Oh, absolutely. We have 150 films. Yeah oral recordings. So yeah, film, film interviews. Yeah. Hey, th thank you. Thank you so much, Linda. Uh, this is amazing. Uh, I'll give it up to you one more time. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much for recording it.